Connecticut Newsmakers starts now on NBC Connecticut HD, Connecticut's news leader. Hi, everybody, and thanks so much for joining us on today's edition of Connecticut Newsmakers. I'm Tom Onahan, and of course, uh, what we'll be talking about over the next 10 years, maybe 20 years, is all about uh, the energy needs of not only the state of Connecticut, but, uh, of course, the United States as well. And we want to welcome to our program this morning our first guest. It's Frank Wolak. Uh, Frank uh, is with the, the company called Fuel Cell Energy. He's vice president of government business. And, Frank, I want to thank you so much for coming in and being with us on our program. Thank you, Tom. It's good to be here. Nice to have you here. You know, we, we talk a little about energy and, and, and what's going on in the future and so forth. Uh, do we really have a handle in terms of what's going to be happening in the future. We hear a lot about wind, and then some people say, well, wind isn't going to work that well. Solar, we don't get enough sun here in the Northeast. Uh, do we really have a handle on what it's going to be like in the next 10, 20 years? Well, there's a lot of um, uh, speculation about what our energy needs will be and what the resources are. And one of the things that certainly we're interested in is, is the uh, development of, of fuel cell technology and how that fits both into a local uh, value for Connecticut as well as the national energy uh, direction that the country's uh, moving toward. Uh, fuel cells are a, a very clean technology. They operate, they're an electrochemical process where they actually extract the energy from a fuel source and they are the most efficient way to convert a fuel to electricity. And because they don't burn fuel, they, um, they don't have any of the harmful pollutants. So they're quiet, clean, easy to cite, and a great complement to the, uh, the infrastructure we need in this country. What is a fuel cell? What does it look like? Well, it, um, it is uh, rather small in, in the scale of uh, power plants. A, uh, a three megawatt fuel cell, for example, that might serve a thousand homes, sits on a 50 by 60 foot area. It takes up far less space than wind or solar technologies, which take ac acres and acres of land to, right. uh, to accommodate. Uh, and tell us a little something about your company. Um, how long have you been uh, in existence and how's everything going? Well, it's going very well. Uh, fuel cell energy has been in business for over 40 years here in Connecticut. We started out life as a research uh, organization in Danbury and doing contract work for the U.S. government. Began to develop fuel cell technology in the 80s with the uh, support of research and development from the Department of Energy. And we began to commercialize fuel cell power plants uh, with our first units going online in uh, early 2003. We now have over 70 installations around the world. And uh, Connecticut is home to a uh, fuel cell industry where nearly 13% of the jobs worldwide are resident here in Connecticut. And that's why we are, quote, the home of the fuel cell, is that right? That's, uh, that's one of the reasons. We've got a significant base of, uh, of people, knowledge, uh, the two largest manufacturers in the world, ourselves and UTC Power, a division of United Technologies, are uh, resident here. But um, beside that, there are over 3,000 people employed in various forms of research and development at the Global Fuel Cell Center at UConn and in various uh, supply chain uh, functions and companies dotted throughout Connecticut. What, what's the, uh, when you talk about those 3,000 people who are employed, uh, what's the potential here in terms of employment here in our state? Is it the sky the limit, so to speak? Well, it's, the sky is the limit uh, based upon how aggressively the U.S. and states like Connecticut move to adopt the technology. Uh, we are seeing that countries like South Korea, for example, have moved very aggressively to adopt what they call clean and renewable policies that include fuel cells on natural gas as a, as a cornerstone of their policy. And what we want to do is to grow this technology as much as a U.S. technology as we possibly can, but unless the U.S. government really takes strides to advance the uh, clean technologies that are homegrown, uh, we do run the risk of having our, uh, our industry eclipsed by other nations who see the value and want those jobs uh, in their own countries. Frank Wallach is our guest. He's vice president of government business for a company called Fuel Cell Energy. Frank, the big uh, energy bill that was just passed by the state general assembly, the governor apparently is still deciding whether or not she's going to sign it or veto it. She could all, I guess, also, I guess, let it just let it become law sure. without her signature. Uh, calls for about 300 megawatts of solar power to be installed in this state in the next 10 years. Really nothing in there for fuel cells. Uh, why is that, and what could that mean? Well, the, uh, the state has been uh, very supportive of the fuel cell industry. What happened in this legislative session is, the, is a very complex energy bill. And as the uh, legislature was putting that together, uh, many of the features that needed to be put into a compromise uh, were, were left out. And there was a heavy emphasis on trying to encourage solar technology in the, uh, in the state. We think that really went too far and there was a lost opportunity for our fuel cell industry as a result of that. 
The, um, it, is, it is always good to have a diversity of resources, but uh, there's very little economic gain out of having a high proportion of solar technology in the, in the state compared to fuel cells. Solar, uh, 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 solar panels uh, do create installation jobs and installers who put them in, but all of the solar technology is acquired from China. So while we don't build any form of manufacturing base as a result of a heavy uh, encouragement of, of solar technologies, we import solar panels from China, we install them, and the cost relative to fuel cells are almost 10 times greater uh, to Connecticut ratepayers. So the economic equation uh, really didn't work uh, as well as we would have expected for encouragement of Connecticut jobs and Connecticut uh, power generation. You'd like to see the governor veto this? Well. The bill is complicated. From our standpoint, we think that there should be a uh, relook at the um, at the provisions that encourage the solar piece and did not include as much diversity of other technologies. So, from that standpoint, a veto would allow people to regroup, rethink rethink the entire bill, and not really wait until uh, next year to pick up the issues about the fuel cell en energy, fuel cell industry, and uh, jobs. Well, you mentioned price. Uh, uh, solar power would be much more expensive. Do you think? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, one of the um, uh, it, solar, solar panels are relatively small, and so when you put them on a house or, or a small commercial building, there's not much of a dollar impact because they're small systems. But the cost to generate electricity is, is enormous. The uh, solar technology doesn't provide very much power. So you make a capital investment, and you only get about 10 or 15, or 15 to 20 percent of the energy converted. So you pay a uh, considerable price for a system that just doesn't see much uh, production of energy. Um, let's talk about the national situation sure. here. Um, research support from the U.S. government, um, are we get, you are getting that, right? I mean, yes. are we getting much of that? But in terms of legislatively here in the state, we're not getting much support. We're getting some support, but you'd like to see more support. We certainly would like to see more, but, but on your point being uh, national, but, um, the U.S. government has done a fantastic job of encouraging the development and research of new technologies, including fuel cells. Where we have really lacked is the motivation to create policies that adopt that technology and deploy it. And that's where we really see the emphasis needs to be placed legislatively uh, on the national level and also the same here at, to the degree that states can help uh, uh, do their part. Uh, I would like to say, though, that uh, from a legislative standpoint nationally, our um, delegation uh, congressional delegation to a person has been uh, exemplary and a real supporter of this industry, the job potential. They really get it when it comes to the, the impact that this uh, uh, technology can have on a national energy policy. What happens, uh, Frank? I mean, I, most people in the state now, and I assume, have, have oil heat or they have uh, natural gas. Mm -hmm. uh, are these still going to be major, perhaps the major ways that people will be heating their homes and businesses? Well. Can we be phasing off that? Well, the way we phase off of that is to encourage higher efficiency utilization of, of any, any uh, generation resources, and fuel cells do that. Uh, but Connecticut really does not have much of a natural resource base. We don't have much wind. The sun doesn't shine very often here. Uh, and so that we're going to be a state that is going to have to figure out how to best utilize the resources, natural gas, oil, or otherwise, that come into the state. Talk about the... Uh you know, the oil spill in the Gulf, that's certainly been in the news, will continue to be for, for quite some time. What's the impact on perhaps, say, your industry? How does that affect you? Well, the, the uh, accident in the, in the Gulf of Mexico was really devastating from an environmental standpoint and, and set back a lot of good ideas about uh, national energy policy. But one of, the, one of the things that we should be looking to as a country is the recognition that we have abundant domestic supplies of natural gas, many of uh, which are located in Pennsylvania, New York, and areas close proximity to uh, using states and uh, the urban industrial areas of the Northeast, and that that fuel resource along with fuel cell technology provides a one-two punch of a domestic resource and a highly efficient conversion uh, uh, system. How many... Uh now, you talk about the fuel cell. Uh, I asked, you know, what does it look like and so mm -hmm. forth, and you said it's a, kind of like a small building, I guess. It's not that big. Uh, how many of those are there uh, in the state, and, and how many do you foresee, say, in the next five to ten years? Well, the state has a renewable portfolio standard that calls for between one and 3,000 megawatts of uh, clean renewable power generation, either in-state or, or acquired from the region. 
There are a handful of locations between ourselves and United Technologies around the state. Uh, Pepperidge Farms Foods in Bloomfield, Yale University, the uh, Middletown, uh, the new school in, um, in Middletown has fuel cells. The new science center downtown uh, has a fuel cell system. The potential in Connecticut alone is uh, upwards of hundreds of megawatts. And what we're looking for is a systematic growth plan to adopt fuel cell technology that allows for us to gain jobs, stabilize the, the workforce we have here in Connecticut, and meet the state's energy needs. Very interesting. Frank, thanks so much for coming in and being with us on our program, and we'll keep an eye and see what the governor does with the, uh, that energy bill on our Very desk. Very good, Tom. Thank thanks you. so much. Appreciate your time. Frank Wolak, Vice President, Government Business, Fuel Cell Energy, based in Danbury. Back with more in a moment.